Muchas gracias. Es un gran gusto estar acá. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. El tema es... Hay una demanda. The thing is... Universal de justicia. There is a universal request for justice. Una oferta. So there is this universal demand for justice, but there is not an offer for justice. When the ICC was created, when the Rome Institutes were drafted, and when justice Garson asked for the arrest of Pinochet in London, well, uh, this uh, led to two parallel ways for this kind of demands. And now we will try and explain why this is important, why the past is important, and what's the future. And instead of, in, in, of introducing them individually, I went to China a couple of years ago. I really liked it. It was a two-day conference, and all 20 panelists, what they did at the very beginning, they speak, they address the audience for a minute, and they summarize what they were going to say. So in a minute, you could get an idea of what they were going to say. Let's be global. Let's learn from Chinese people. And let's start with you. Thank you so much, Liz. Let me introduce myself. My presentation will be very brief. I would like to thank the Foundation Baltazar Garzón and to Baltazar Garzón for having invited us to take part in here. I am Paloma Serrano. I am from, uh, I'm the, from Women's Link. And whenever we take part in this type of fora, we always try we, uh, we come to the fora to uh, make women more visible, to streamline the gender perspective. So I would like to share with you why universal justice has helped us uh, vis make visible gender-based crimes that were committed in Guatemala and that also led to sentencing the perpetrators in Guatemala. And I will finish off discussing, well, the, or, or, or sharing a number of ideas uh, for the future. Hello, my name is Gonzalo Martinez Fresneda. I am a lawyer. I will talk about the present and the future of um, universal jurisdiction based on the most relevant uh, uh, rulings of the Spanish uh, courts, and I would also tell you about the uh, political context that has led uh, way to the amendments made on the law about universal jurisdiction, and I would also refer to the case of uh, Juan Baltasar Garzón and what happens with his prosecution for civil war crimes. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Les Lepoy. I am a lawyer. And I will try to talk about the incorporation of the inclusion of Princeton principles of universal jurisdiction. Basically, I refer to those ideas. First, that the principle of universal jurisdiction becomes an imperative norm of international law, so that the states do not have the faculty or the, 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 the obligation, but they have the obligation to implement universal jurisdiction. And often it is said that universal jurisdiction implies possibility of prosecuting crimes committed um, anywhere. Well, I would try to include the idea that not only anywhere in the world, but any time in history. Or So I will finish with a number of conclusions. But as I said, we try to uh, talk about the evolution of this principle as of 1996, when it all started. So Cristina Carlotto, she's got 37 years of experience in the search seeking justice. She will tell us about the past, the present, and the future of universal justice. Good afternoon. I would like to dearly thank the foundation and our dear friend, Bal Justice Carson, for having invited me to take part in this conference. It is not the first conference that I share with him uh, because we would like, we wanted to show him our uh, friendliness, and we wanted to accompany him. I am the president of the Association of the Grandmothers of the Maze Square, Mothers of the Maze Square. I am just a grandmother, a woman, a teacher, a mother. That, yes, as you very well said, uh, Luis, I've been fighting all these years for the truth. Justice. I'm an expert in searching, in searching, in seeking. Uh, well, I have lots of perseverance and lots of will, all my will, to 
uh, lo lose my life if necessary to fight against something that happened to us that changed our life and when we really want to have when to find some hope and well I will make uh, my, my honest my modest contribution and I will share with you everything that we are doing in our country. I have a question for all panelists. Uh, it, it is for me, but uh, I'll extend it to all panelists. How should universal utilization evolve in the future to prevent impunity from happening? And what's the role you attach to the ICC as part of this very much needed evolution for universal jurisdiction. As I said, there is a clear demand, but not an offer for universal jurisdiction. It is quite a paradox how back in 1998, there were two turning points, Rome, July, over 120 states approved the creation or foundation of the ICC, and it happened, it was founded then. And a few months later, Justice Garçon requested the extradition of Pinochet from London, which led to two different ways of facing the problem of universal justice. One, Garçon, who is a national domestic judge dealing with uh, with crimes committed in a different territory, but without an agreement with uh, such territory. And then the other case is completely different because that's not about universal justice. It is the state that is part of the ICC and is aware and willingly enters into an agreement. Sometimes it's difficult. Chile, France, the constitution had to be reformed. In Norway, King, the king himself, that is above the law, and he's the top authority, and according to the Rome Statute, no one can be in, can have impunity. So he had to repeal his own rights so that Norway could be part of it. So it is hard. When he was appointed back in uh, April 2003, there were 68 states. As I left, 122. Well, 121 when I left, 122 now. So 122 that are part of the mm, international community, and there are 72 more that are not uh, here. How this will be changed? Well, I guess this will change depending on social media that use this as content. Because if you look into the situation in Argentina compared to what happened in Spain, well, this is not the result of a one man's action. In Argentina, with the human rights groups, they kept memory alive, and after the fall of the regime, after elections in 83, they started broadcasting and disseminating what had happened. At the very beginning, April, sorry, end of 1982, 14% of the people, only 14% requested the, the quest for the truth from the past. But in a recent survey, after the dissemination of the information, we've seen that uh, the media reflected the stories, we see remains and uh, people have been shot in the head, which led to a change in the institution. The political debate, the electoral campaign, was based with facts from Argentina's uh, situation in the 70s. Policymakers got nervous, and then they had this clean slate act, and Mothers and grandmothers were supposed to be an people, and they didn't want people to discuss this, but they could not put an end to this process. And then there was a discussion and a debate in the media, and this idea of looking into the past became a hot topic. 74% now wanted to have this looked into. There was this uh, self-pardon law issued. There was a radical MP who wanted to avoid it. He became even more popular. He got 59% of all the votes. And Peron's regime, 40%. And Marika's party, which was the armed forces, got just 1%. That social awareness 
meant that the first law adopted by the parliament afterwards, when we resumed democracy, the first one was voiding the laws by the military groups. It was adopted by Alberto Grada, who is a support, famous supporter of military groups. So it was a transformation of human rights, democratic and political opening for presidential candidates and people voting. Back in 85, in Argentina, we took votes and, and the context was very complicated for all of us. So a few years later, in 88, there was a Plessis side and Pinochet lost, but got 84% of all the votes. So he had, uh, sorry, 54%, so half the country was with him. In Uruguay, at 89, another referendum, was the European city voted not to look into the past. So our experience was not so unique. But after that, Alfonsin, President Alfonsin started the trials against the military junta and worked with other groups, transforming information into a well-organized and formal document which explains what happened. And after we had the trials to the juntas, that was just third for us that proved